As you can probably sense, it's been a very long time that I've faced an audience of so many young people. Uh, and I'm nervous, as I should be. Uh, when you get to my stage in life, you're faced with age, ailment, and inevitable death. And you ask yourself, what is it to be young? Some of us try to cling to our youth. Doesn't work, will never work. But one word which I think stays with me when I meet probably somewhat elder students in class is one word which is enshrined in all of us, a capacity which is available to all of us and which is the capacity of youth, which is the word imagine. A word of immense beauty, immense capacity, power. And let's try and imagine a situation. And let's not even talk about that man called M.K. Gandhi. Forget that he was, forget that he probably is, but let's try and imagine what it would be to be young in 19th century, what it would be to, to be young in the 20th century, not in the 21st century. And let's see if that man, what he sought to do, makes any sense to us. If it does not, let him be. He's past his history. If he makes sense, then maybe he is part of us, maybe he is part of our present, maybe also part of our future. The first capacity, as I said, to be young is to be imaginative. And, and what, do, what do young people do? They're restless. Why are we restless? Because we ask fundamental questions. Questions about ourselves, questions about our society, about the society in which we live, the context in which we function, the rules by which we are bound, the circumstances that we wish, wish to overcome. So the first capacity that we have is to ask fundamental questions. If we don't have the capacity to ask questions, what is this schooling all about? Why are we, what are we training ourselves to do? It's really the capacity to ask questions is what the purpose of education is. So to be young is to be able to ask very basic fundamental questions. The second thing is to try and overcome those boundaries. Boundaries of our birth, boundaries of our gender, sometimes of our sexualities, sometimes of our class, of our education, and try and reach out, what we call to explore. Because what the young do is to explore the world in various ways, through their bodies, through food, through languages that we learn, the people that we wish to communicate with. And doing that, we overcome the boundaries of our particular station that I am somebody who's born in a particular community, in a particular social, economic, political, cultural context, and I wish to reach out to people who are not like me. And unless we can reach out to people who are not like us, our life is bloody boring. What are we doing? We're only talking to ourselves, right? So the young reach out, the young experiment. And that's really what causes a lot of disharmony because we wish, the young wish to experiment. They wish to experiment with food, clothing, style, fashion, but not just that. Sometimes we experiment with our bodies. Sometimes we experiment with the society around us. Sometimes we are confined in a lab and experiment in a controlled environment. But unless we experiment, there is no experiential learning that we do. So the idea of the experiment. Then, when you experiment, there is always the possibility and the fear of failure. The reason why people at my age don't experiment, because we're just too afraid to fail. I am afraid to fail at 50. I can't afford to fail, I think. And that's, that's the way I have constructed my self-image as somebody who does not fail. And therefore, probably, I don't experiment or I experiment in a very bounded way, in a very safe way. I do things that I know I'm capable of doing. I don't do things that I know I'm not capable of. 
I don't do the kind of travel that some of you will do. I don't go hiking. I'm not fit. I, I don't try and learn the fifth language or the sixth language that I need to learn to do my work because I am afraid that I will not succeed. But to, to be able to experiment is to be able to deal with failure, to not have the fear of failure. To be young, therefore, is to be fearless. And to be young, therefore, is to have the capacity to free oneself. But what the young have is something that we have lost, is the capacity to be honest. I have lived a life, many of us have lived a life full of moral compromises. Not the everyday kind of compromise that we do of jumping the red light. That's, that's something that we, many of us are guilty of. But we also are implicated in making moral choices that we know are untenable. The young are capable of being innocent. The young are capable of being naive. And naivet and innocence are not bad words. These are very positive qualities because it allows us to make grounded moral choices which are difficult. And that's what all of you are capable of. Now, try and extrapolate that situation, not in the context of today. Let's try and put it in the 19th century. Let's try and put it in the early 20th century. And what are you going to get? You're going to get a world that's dominated by one culture, one power, that rules two-thirds of the humanity, denying you and me my capacity to determine our future, determine our present. Imagine a state in which you are bounded. Imagine a state in which you are not free. Not free to determine anything. Not free to determine the, the education that you will receive. Not free to determine whether you will bear arms or not bear arms. You're not free to determine what you will eat. You're not free to determine who your rulers are and how you wish to be ruled. You're not free. And that's the reality. That's one kind of a problem. The second problem that you're faced with, and it's something that all of us are faced with even today in some measure, is a world that is completely untenably unequal. Inequality is dehumanizing for itself, but inequality is also untenable. You cannot have a world which is governed and ruled by a very few for the benefit of those few. That is not a sustainable... Kartike was here just probably half an hour, 45 minutes before that, right? And he would have spoken about some notions of what is called permanence, some, something called economy or, or, or sustainability. It is not possible to have a world which is perfectly marked with inequality. Third, it's a world where opportunities are denied to you. What's, what's very beautiful about you and what's very beautiful about India of today is that all of you can imagine a future for yourself. Maybe some of you imagine multiple futures for yourself. You wish to do in one lifetime many things. But that autonomy is available to you. That possibility is available to you. That enabling conditions obtain in our country today. And that's something which is not available. It's not available because that's a state of unfreedom does to you. And then what is it that you're faced with? You're faced with a situation of taking responsibility to obtain freedom not only for yourself but for everyone because one person being free while the rest are bounded is not possible that's called in a in a group of people if only one is free and others are not then that person is a master and other slaves so you can't obtain freedom only for one person. You have to obtain freedom for all, for even one person to experience deep 
freedom. What we are faced with in the 19th century, not just in India, but in Africa, in Latin America, in the Pacific Rim, large parts of Eastern Europe, is this dehumanizing lack of freedom. And among a lot of people who begin in the 19th century to think about freedom is one person who lived very close to, to where we are on the banks of Sabarmati, a man called M.K. Gandhi. But I don't wish to talk about Gandhi, the freedom fighter, because he's been done to boredom in your textbooks. Uh, um, textbooks are very harmful sometimes. Uh, uh, uh. But what does he do? He experiments. What does he experiment with? With himself. Because the most fearful experiment that you can conduct is on yourself. The most fundamental experiment that you can conduct is on yourself. It's very easy to conduct an experiment onto the other. If I have in a position of power vis-a-vis -vis you, I can conduct an experiment on you. I can control you. Right? But to be able to control yourself and do an experiment on yourself is the most frightening of things. Because when you go wrong, you go horribly wrong with yourself. But that's also very empowering because you know that you, in that failure, there is no harm unto another. Don't forget, Gandhi calls his life an experiment. He's somebody who's experimenting all the time. He's experimenting with food. Name the kind of experiment in food that you would want to do, and he's done it. From eating what you call whole foods to eating only fruits. I mean, you're too young to go on a diet, but you know, don't recommend that. Um, eating only things which are cooked with sunlight, eating one meal a day, eating only five things in a day, not eating at all, eating meat, not eating meat, smoking, not smoking, one kind of gamut of experiences around food. Perhaps one of the greatest experiments on food has been Gandhi. The second set of experiences and experiments are about his body, about his own sexuality, about wanting to overcome his own passions in a way that he thought was something that was not enabling him to do the work that he needed to do. Experimenting with, with clothing. He's somebody who's constantly fashioning a new identity for himself. If you were to ever go to the Sabarmati Ashram and there is a panel there, uh, which is just narrating Gandhi's life through the semantics of his clothes. From somebody who's in Rajkot and poor Bandar and Bhavnagar, we're going to London, dressing up in a particular way, being in South Africa, doing something else, to adopting the clothes of what we call Tamil coolie workers, to coming back to India and adopting the clothes of a Kathiawadi peasants, to finally seeing the man that you see wearing almost nothing. And then have the courage, cultural courage, not personal courage, to go in those clothes to the king emperor and say, this is who I am. So there's a series of experiments that he does, and these are very politically conscious experiments, signaling things to us and to others. Experiments with food, clothing, body. He travels, something that the young wish to do all the time. He is, an, he is a constant traveler. Between him and Tagore, the other who lived the other shore of the country, between the two of them, they were the most widely traveled Indians of all times, perhaps. There was not a country that Tagore hadn't visited, and there was not a part of this country that Gandhi did not know, like the back of his palm. Constantly in the train, 
constantly in the move, traveling, meeting people, getting to know what the lay of the land is, something that we all of us wish to do for other reasons. His reasons were different. But it's the constant process of traveling that you discover the other and discover yourself. And that's what Gandhi is doing. What else does he do? He wishes to communicate, something that you, you know, defines the India of today is our ability and the need to communicate almost everything, including the breakfast that I've had this morning. Take a photograph and send it to somebody. If you were to go to the ashram, you would find in the archives of the ashram 35,000 letters that Gandhi wrote. That's a lot of texting. Some of these letters are three lines, some of these letters are 56 pages. He's constantly communicating with the world. He's receiving letters and he's answering them. Almost the way we do. The mode is different, the technology is different, but the need is not different, the desire is not different, the ability to connect is not different. It's just that it's a different technological mode. He's also communicating to us through other means. At no point in his life after 1903 that he does not own a newspaper. Gandhi owned a series of newspapers and ran them successfully. He was the first man to print a newspaper in six languages in the world. The Indian opinion in South Africa was printed in six languages. It's the only broadsheet to come out simultaneously in six languages in one fold. The need to communicate, need to speak, need to reach out, and in through that process, enable, empower, free. That's, that's one kind of a person that we're talking about. He's not this toothless man, hairless man that you see on holdings. He is, he is very much like you. doing exactly what we do. He's constantly imagining a state of freedom for us. He's constantly imagining a situation where you and I could live a life of dignity. He's also not somebody that we call an idealist, because I know that the word, oh, he is an idealist or she is an idealist, is something that we wish to stay away from, because it signals certain sort of non-practicality, non-pragmatic sense of things. Here is somebody who understands what political economy is. He wants to provide solutions to the day-to-day -day issues of our, that confront our life. And what is it that confronts our life today, most significantly? What are we discussing? We're talk, talking about joblessness, Jobless growth, I mean, there is growth, but there are no jobs, we're told. But there is huge, huge, huge number of young people who go out every year, are faced with the prospect of no future, no productive future. And Gandhi is confronted with the same issue. And he comes up with an answer that's the kind of answer that we are seeking today. Of course, you know that the, the Indian state seeks to provide you guarantee of employment. It calls itself Manrega, Mahatma Gandhi National Rural Employment Guarantee Scheme. Why? You, if you do not allow people jobs in their environment, they will all be forced to migrate. Migration is one of the most dehumanizing experiences. Because then you lose your sense of belonging, you lose your sense of citizenship, you lose your sense of enti entitlements, you lose the surroundings from which you emerge because you're forced to migrate for a meal in search of work. Gandhi's answer is very, very similar to the kind of answer that we're trying to give today. Give employment to people where they are situated. Give them what is called skills. What are the skills that you need to give? Skills that everybody can acquire. I can't, I can't skill everybody into becoming 
a theoretical physicist. Sorry, doesn't work that way. We need them, and we need them in larger numbers than what we do. Right? But the fact is, that's not what we can. Skilling is for vocation, for earning your livelihood, where you are, with the things that you have around you, and you try and skill people doing that. So this obscure thing called the charkha is not so obscure after all. It's not so obsolete after all. Forget that mechanical movement of the charkha for a while and say, can you think of an object today, an activity today, which meets the following criteria? That is something that everyone can do. Requires no special training. You can be taught to be a spinner in seven hours, even if you have two left hand. So no skill required. It's an object that can be made anywhere, can be repaired anywhere. It produces something that all of us need. Cloth, in this particular instance. It is something that gives you employment regardless of other agriculture or industrial cycles. Because some of you study economics and would know that when there is an agricultural cycle or an industrial cycle, some people will not have jobs, either for temporary periods or longer periods. Can you design an economic activity that is not susceptible to these production cycles that other activities are part of? And Finally, is it something which is environmentally sustainable? Because if it's not environmentally sustainable, that activity is not for us anymore. And that's the challenge that we are faced with today. Today, we have not been able to come up with either an object, an activity, a process, a product system, or a cycle that meets all these criteria of equability, availability, locality, sustainability, and therefore completely democratically available to all of us. He thought that the answer lay for himself in his times in this thing called the spinning wheel. And he's not satisfied with objects as they are. Some of you uh, know the National Institute of Design, uh, which is about six kilometers from where we are. There is a history why that place is there. And I'm not going to get into the history of the NID. But it has a deep link to not only the families which helped create that institution, but to that man, M.K. Gandhi. The India's first design competition, properly designed competition, was launched in 1929 by Gandhi, which carried a price in 1929 of 100,000 rupees, which was to design a charkha which enhanced productivity, which enhanced reduced physical labor. The prize was awarded only in 1956 when a product was designed which met all its criteria. He's innovating. He's thinking. He is doing things with his hands, with his body, with his mind. He's communicating with us. He's trying to learn new languages. Did he speak 14 languages? Not really. Um, he signed his name in 14 languages. So he had at least some knowledge of 14 scripts. Um, Gujarati, Hindi, English, taught, knew enough Tamil to teach Tamil, knew enough Urdu to teach Urdu, Telugu. On the day he was assassinated, he was taking his Bangla lessons. Of course, if you were trained to be a barrister, you had to, whether you liked it or not, everybody had to pass an exam in French and another in Latin. These are the languages with his functioning with, something exactly what you do. because. You are a person of this world, just like you are a person of this world with all these abilities and needs to communicate, to overcome the constraints in which you are placed. He is doing something very similar. 
And he is doing things in, an, in a way that appear to us as obscure. They appear to us as obsolete. You take that activity away and think of the principle of each of these things and say, what is it that this man is trying to do? And you would probably come up with an answer that he was trying to imagine freedom. He was trying to imagine an equal world, a just world, a more livable world. Not for himself, but for all of us. Finally, we always ask this question, is the man relevant? Why should he be? He died 70 years ago. I mean, he was killed 70 years ago. Somebody who's part of history, is that his burden to be relevant today? Do we ask that question of my dead grandfather? Or is he relevant today? Of course he's relevant today because I use his table. Right? I mean, I have, I have a table of his. That's the only way he's relevant. There's some legacy that we have. But it's what we make of that legacy that makes that person relevant or not. It's not his burden to be relevant. We need to ask ourselves a qu simple question. And the question is very simple. Are we happy with the world in which we live? If we are, then Gandhi is not relevant. Nobody is relevant. And nobody needs to be relevant because we are completely contained and happy and satisfied with the world that we've created and we live in. But if our answer is, maybe not. Maybe we are unhappy with the injustice. Maybe we are unhappy with the hunger. Maybe we are unhappy with the lack of opportunity. Maybe as a woman I feel violated. Maybe as a woman I feel unsafe. I feel my freedom is constantly being redefined in a way that hems me and constricts me and makes me more and more confined, then maybe, maybe we need to ask ourselves, can we think of situations, can we think of solutions and learn from them? And one of the persons that you will need to turn to, inevitably, if you're confronted with questions of injustice, untruth, violence to your body, to your mind, to your, to your fellow human beings. One of the persons, not the only one, because then it would be hegemonic, very powerful, very undemocratic, but one of the persons that you should turn to with your own sets of questions is a man called M.K. Gandhi. He will not disappoint you. He will challenge you. He will make you very uneasy. He will take possession of your life. He's like a virus. He enters your system and stays there. Dormant sometimes, sometimes not so dormant. Confront him in your own way and you would come back, I think, far more richer. Thank you.